2010 was a very good year for the gaming industry, with games like Fallout New Vegas, Red Dead Redemption, and Play Mobile Nights. A game which got a 4 out of 5 on the website 10 year olds used to persuade their parents to allow them to buy GTA. Amnesia was one of the games to release in 2010, a terrifying horror game which you could say took the world by storm, leading to millions of people watching a funny Swedish man scream at barrels. <laughs> As much as I would love to talk about amnesia, I'm gonna shove that to the side because I have a deep and undeniable love for a different game. <laughs> Outlast was released on the 4th of September 2013, exactly three years after Amnesia. I know I said I'm not talking about Amnesia, but it's kind of relevant to this point. As Outlast, said by the developers in Red Barrel Studios, claims that they were blatantly stealing Amnesia's survival mechanics, which I think is f***ing disgusting, and they should be hanged, drawn, and quartered for disgusting copyright infringement. The reason why I'm bringing up Amnesia is because I feel Amnesia really laid the stones for horror games, leading to games such as Outlast, and I thought it'd be rude not to mention where I think Outlast originated, as this video is about Outlast, so it, it kind of makes some sense, you know? So, here we are, onto the video. Subscribe. And yes, I know I'm like nine years late to make this video, please forgive me. You play as a freelance investigative journalist called Mars Upshaw, who was sent a cheeky DM from someone within the Mount Massive Asylum, claiming things like dream therapy were being taken too far and people are being hurt and profited off from a company under the name Murkov. I was intrigued by the name Murkov and what could have inspired Red Barrel Studios, so I did a little Google search. I couldn't find anything directly on Murkov being a real company, but I did find out the logo represents a guillotine, which is for real, kind of creepy. After Mars got the message from the whistleblower, he decides to take a tiny trip to Lakeside, Colorado, to see if the rumours of the crimes are true. He parks his car at the entrance, which seems to be empty. He passes through the gate and heads towards the main door. The main door seems to be locked. So the genius himself decides to break in through an open window. The area seems empty, so Mars keeps walking further and further into the asylum through the office blocks, finding documents talking about a project under the name Wall Rider, with a patient mentioned in the project with the initials WPH, but Billy for short claiming that Billy has asked about a lawsuit about his mother and Murkov. We don't know who Billy is yet, but one thing we can say is that Murkov is clearly doing something wrong if a patient's mother is suing them. Mars carries on and comes to one of those video game air duct tunnels, which are in far too many games and media, by the way. Mars gets through the air vent, noticing that there is no way to get back. He is truly oh, no. stuck. Oh, oh man, I'm stuck. So he's no choice but to carry on. Miles carries on walking to see what he could find, but he is struck by the mistake he has made. Announcing the first jump scare for the game! Woo! Miles with no other choice has to carry on through the door into a pitch black room, with the only way to see is his camcorder on night vision mode, where he comes in contact with a security guard impaled on a pipe, a method used by Vlad the Impaler where a large spike is shoved down the bottom of the- you, you, you know what? You get the idea. Mars can't backtrack anymore, so he has no other choice but to take the chances with whatever impaled the security guard. So he goes deeper into the dark abyss that is Mount Massive to get to the exit door. And this is where Mars is introduced to none other than Chris Walker. Little fake. Chris Walker is a very unique person in Outlast, and is one of the recurring villains of the game. So I thought I should do a bit of an explanation of how he became the utterly disfigured monster he is. I have put a timestamp if you don't want to hear, but I think you should. A document in the game states that Chris Walker used to be a military policeman and had toured Afghanistan several times before being admitted into Springle Top Psychotherapy Clinic in Hatton, Texas, due to very extreme levels of PTSD, in which he was treated using dream therapy and several forms of hypnosis, which helped release his trauma and allow him to work for Murkov as a surveillance officer. He was constantly bullied by his fellow employees for his stature and inhumane strength, and given the name Strong Fat, which he truly despised. Chris was yet mentally improving and was in a good place, but he broke down during one psychiatric session, where Chief Psychotherapist Dr. Claymore was relating Arabic cultural stories with Christian stories as a way to show that all cultures originated from the same place. But this broke him down, and he slaughtered three inmates in a blind, uncontrollable rage. This was no longer Chris Walker, but a monster who rips the skin off his face as he thinks it'll help him see more clearly. Chris grabs Miles and throws him off the first floor, which, if it was me, I'd probably be dead. But Miles isn't. He is only knocked unconscious for a short while, until he is woken up by a man called Father Martin, 
Father Martin seems to think of Mars as an apostle and a gift from the merciful God. Merciful God, you have sent me an apostle. Guard your life, son. Mars then proceeds to fall back into unconsciousness. Mars wakes up without the father in sight. And as any sane person, Mars goes straight to the security room to unlock the f***ing doors. This is a horror game, so you're not getting in that easy. Mars needs a security card. This may be a really insignificant part of the game, but I think this shows how good of a game Outlast is, as you have to walk past three patients in a room watching static on a TV, not knowing who in this ghastly building is with or against you. I'm not joking when I tell you this, but my dumb ass thought I had to sneak around them, so I spent 20 goddamn minutes trying to find a way without getting caught. Turns out, they were so off their heads, likely on meds, that I could just walk past them. But this shows how unique Outlast is as on your first time playing, you have absolutely no clue who is on your side or against you. Unlike literally every single game. <laughs> Mars gets into the security office and starts to unlock the doors and turn the security systems off to escape this hellhole. But the supposed friendly face doesn't like that idea and turns the power off. I'm calling him a friendly face as he's the first person you see in the game which is alive and doesn't throw you off a balcony, so that's at least a positive. The camera showed Mars that to get the power back on, he needs to flip a comedically large switch. So that's what he does. He heads to the basement, avoids a few psych patients, which try to slash him with knives, and whacks back on the power without any scratches. Well, supposedly no scratches. If you the game, you've probably got a few. Once back in the security room, he restarts opening the door, but is grabbed by Father Martin and injected with a fuck ton of horse tranquilizer and shows Miles something truly terrifying. Sorry, my son. I didn't want to have to do this to you. But you can't leave. Not yet. There is so much yet for you to witness. Will you see it? Can you? Our Lord, the Wall Rider, tearing his truth into the unbelievers. The only way out of this place is the truth. Accept the gospel, and all doors will open before. Oz wakes up in a cell in the middle of the prison sector with crosses written in blood all over the walls. Clearly, Father Martin put you here. But this is different as if he was like some of the other people here, then why didn't he just kill you? He had the perfect opportunity to. Clearly, he wants to show you something. Maybe you haven't seen enough of this so-called wall rider. Another inmate unlocks the door, likely under Father Martin's accords. And this is where you meet the twins, two people which are very much naked and want to kill you. They kill him slow. But they don't because Father Martin is apparently telling them not to. Yes. I would like to kill him, as would I. The preacher asked us not to. Something deeper is going on here, and Mars seems like a pawn to a wider plan. There's no one in the asylum to trust, so Mars has no other choice but to trust Father Martin, the man who's already put like a whole syringe worth of ketamine into your neck. You escape the cell block by a crack in the wall from one of the cells. You step up on a box, and climb up. And the first thing you see is a d After that odd, um, you know, situation, you walk upon text written on the wall, presumably written by Father Martin. You listen to him, and you follow the blood. Carrying on following the blood trail can lead you to a document which states that Finger painting was seriously helping a patient called Marchin Arch Ar 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 Archibald, which is wonderful, and a normal psychiatric ward would embrace it. But Mount Massive had it banned, leading to Martin Archibald to fall back into an even worse state. Even to be quoted by Dr. Neil Wolfram, that I can't imagine the logic at play here, unless Murkov wants our patients to become more disengaged from reality. This can't be a normal psychiatric ward if finger painting is banned. Mars carries on following the blood trails coming to a halt which he jumps down. Behind him is a door. Mars then walks through the door, coming to a patient. A patient which claims that they weren't experiments, they were rituals. They weren't experiments, they were rituals. A conjuring. This may be words from an utterly insane man, but every step you take within Mount Massive makes the patient sound more and more correct. Maybe you're going insane. Mars carries on following the blood trails, coming to a ledge where he climbs up, and 
I'm gonna be a lot of other common video game stuff. Apart from seeing the naked twins again and a man literally rip a guy's head off. Oh wait, oh, never mind, that's Chris Walker. Yep, yeah, that's usual. The blood trails come to the shower block. Miles sees a hole in the floor, which an inmate jumps down. Miles may have just found another exit. To carry on progressing and not be brutally murdered, sexual intercourse, or several other horrendous damn bad things, you hop out of a window and shuffles across a ledge to get away from a psych patient. He gets back in by another window and carries on towards the security room, which is controls to a decontamination pod, to progress to the main shower room to try and escape the asylum through the sewers. But Chris appears out of thin air. <laughs> He needs to find another way towards the exit hole in the showers. After a bit of an encounter with Chrissy, Mars walks into a fat cell block, the very area Chris ripped the guy's head off. This area is pretty much just a climbing gym, to be honest with you. Not much to say. I mean, unless you want to go to a children's play park, but anyone watching this video is definitely not allowed within like five miles of any children. Hey guys, today we're going to see how parents react when we flash their kids. But there is one thing. Close to the top of the so-called jungle gym was a document located in a cell block with the word witness written in blood all over the walls. The document explains the story of a man called Dr. Rudolf G. Wernicke, who was born in 1918 Munich, Germany, who achieved scientific fame for a paper him and Alan Turing wrote. The note also claims that he migrated to the USA after a quoted cloudy history with the German war effort. Like a lot of the German scientists taken from Germany to help the Manhattan Project in the USA, could Dr. Rudolf Wernicke be one of those scientists. After his so-called government research in Los Alamos, he went to New Mexico, where he retired to landscape photography and to care for his cats, and maybe eat some chicken. Hello! To very shortly after entering retirement, to then leave retirement, to then pursue a career of charitable work for the Murkoff Corporation. A statement from the company even calls Dr. Wernicke a true humanitarian with a generous effort. Ending the sentence there, leaving a truly creepy ending to a document, saying that he leaves no survivors. Once at the top of the cell block, Mars finds a hole in the floor, showing that this is where Father Martin wants you to go. You walk down a set of stairs into an average looking American high school's changing rooms with blood on the lockers, while the blood taking shape into a word, the word saying wall rider. Looking similar to that of a shrine, this wall rider is seen as a god to the patients. They weren't experiments. They were rituals. A, a conjuring. Walking into the shower rooms places you next to the hole you saw earlier. Finally, a way out. Oh, for fuck's sake, this is so a fucking sewer level! Once you build up the resilience to deal with another game, with a sewer level, you find your way towards a manhole, which seems to potentially lead to the exit, which happens to conveniently be blocked with water. This means you have to find and rotate two valves, a moderately easy task. All right, pause for a sec. This part of the game is my least favourite, not only due to sewer levels on a whole being saturated, but the enemies are starting to feel slightly repetitive. I mean, by this point in the game, you've already seen Chris six times. I get that Red Barrel Studios may be aiming for you to build some sort of intimate relationship with the enemy, but I'm by sorry. this point, I feel the enemy is a little bit too dependent. Anyways, once you turn the female ward on the prison block drain valve, the water dissipates and you can climb down the manhole. At the bottom, you can see a significant amount of patients who seem to fail escaping the water. A very sad end for the poor sods. Walking through the dark abyss, you come to a light clearing, 
a light which eventually destroys your hope for an escape, as you are met with screams of pain and the sound of flesh being torn in two. Walking down a long corridor with your feet clanking on the floor, making you question who's near, you come to a door. Once opening this door, you are introduced to a patient, a patient which claims he's right in the mind, like you. You still know what's real. The doctor's dead, you know that, right? Dr. Berenike died before he even started working here. What kind of experiments does a dead doctor perform on living patients? That's the question. The patients seem to know that Vernica is dead, but how? And why does the patients think a dead doctor is experimenting on patients? What is Project Wall Rider, and where does Vernica fit into all of this? As you carry on walking, you come to a blood-covered tunnel. Hopefully, Miles has some AIDS pills, because if Chris doesn't kill him, AIDS will. Eventually, after following the blood tunnel, you reach a large pitch-black room, something very different to the rest of the aesthetic of this game. As Outlast usually takes place in an essence of claustrophobia, but now you're in a massive room filled with water up to your waist, where you don't know what's below or behind you. I think that's scary on its own, not knowing if you're alone. But in this case, you're not alone, because Chris is there with you. When you reach the next blood-covered tunnel, you hear demonic screams, that which couldn't be made by a patient. but you've no choice to carry on towards it. This place is terrifying. <laughs> Finally out of the sewers, you reach the mail ward. Hopefully, we won't have to deal with Chris anymore. Entering through a vent, you seem to place yourself in a bloody hospital. A very bloody hospital. At the end of a room, you find a document. A document which is from a Rick Traeger. The document talks about how another patient couldn't make it, and that Traeger tried his best as a doctor, a new doctor at that. The document also uses a lot of surgical analogies, such as cutting the fat from the Wall Rider project, and that the project has been bleeding money. If you ask me, this person doesn't seem like a professional doctor, but he does mention Billy, the person we learned about at the entrance into Mount Massive. Why is Billy so significant? And why is he causing money to so-called bleed? Carrying on with the idea of escaping, you land yourself into what seems to be a B-Tech torture chamber. But Outlast decides to give you no time to process the situation, and you get straight into a chase scene. This long, hectic chase scene ends with a glimpse of hope as you hear a voice over an intercom which seems friendly, telling you to get inside one of those mini elevator thingies to reach safety. However, you have been bamboozled. Hey, you're that bullshit priest's guy, aren't you? As a witness or whatever, you must be exhausted. No, let's take a break, huh, buddy? The old two martini lunch? Hmm? Have a little confab, blah, blah. Once again, I'm gonna give some context to Dr. Traeger, just like what I did with Chris. So skip to this time if you don't want to hear his backstory. But once again, I think you should. Traeger, before becoming a disfigured monster, was the head of the business department and one of the executives of research at Mount Massive who happened to also be an atheist, potentially being a reason for his disdain for Father Martin. Using his job, Traeger was able to place himself friendships with people in high places within the business, such as playing golf with the head of Mount Massive and the director of Project Wall Rider. Traeger was a sick-minded person from birth, so much so his own father attempted to convince him not to become a doctor, but this always remained a goal in the back of Traeger's psyche. One day, 
Two mitigation officers with the names Pauline Glick and Paul Marion were called into Traeger's workplace in regards to a HR complaint. Traeger greets the investigators joyfully and enthusiastically, claiming to be a team player, and that the investigator should be on Team Rick. Traeger, however, wasn't as kind and socially acceptable as he thought he was, as he was harassing the female mitigation officer throughout the whole meeting. Pauline decided to invite Rick to dinner, not as a date, but rather to learn more about his character and if he was the cause of such HR complaint. Traeger and Pauline meet for dinner at a restaurant where he tells Pauline about his childhood and how his father never supported his ambitions. After dinner, Traeger takes Pauline back to his place and after offering her some cocaine, which she declines, he gives her a bottle of scotch, which she also declines in favor of red wine. This gave Pauline some time to study Traeger as while Traeger is preparing the wine, Pauline explores his house, finding magazines on how to perform surgery and a pamphlet for an abortion clinic. Once Traeger finally got the bottle open, Pauline sits back down and starts to drink some wine. The wine tastes weirdly sour. Pauline realises Traeger has spiked her drink. In shock, Pauline pulls out her gun on Traeger and forces him to drink the spiked wine, allowing Pauline to escape once Traeger passed out. Pauline and Paul then reunite and confront her pregnant Murkoff employee with the name Michelle Has asking if she was the one to send the complaint about Traeger, as Pauline believed it could be her, as the abortion clinic pamphlet could have been directed towards her. Michelle then reveals the disgusting truth about Traeger, and he forced himself upon her and got her pregnant, giving her the choice of having an abortion or losing her job. Michelle was then paid for her silence by Murkoff by request of Paul, allowing Michelle to care for her child while not having to work for Murkoff, but at the cost of silence. Michelle, while handing her security clearance to the head of Matt Massive, was met with an extremely angry Traeger, calling the two investigators liars and claiming that Michelle can't prove anything. Traeger then proceeded to pick up a pair of scissors and stab Michelle repeatedly in the stomach, severely injuring her. This resulted in a fight between Traeger and the mitigation officers, leading to Traeger accidentally stabbing his leg and Pauline scraping parts of his scalp off with a paper cutter. Traeger was then admitted into Mount Massive and used for experiments, as his crimes would damage the company if he were to be released to the public. Once the asylum broke down and all the inmates went rampant, Traeger decided to disguise himself as a surgeon and let his childhood fantasies run wild. You know, I love the mountain air up here at night. You, you want to head out and take a stroll? <laughs> Go ahead, I'll be here. <laughs> Go on, run free! <laughs> I'm in no hurry. No? All right. Nose to the grindstone, I like that. Okay then, right this way. Mm -mm -mm -mm. After being forced into a wheelchair, Traeger takes you to a private room. You have fallen into the lion's den. A lion which likes to play with its food. It's where he might just a little bit crazy. Tied up, Mars realises he's buggered and that he doesn't have his usual choice to run and hide. Traeger lets his childhood fantasies take over him and he proceeds to cut off four of your fingers just for his own pleasure. You paying attention? Don't pass that on me. It's so <laughs> Yeah. Traeger then walks out the room, likely to tend to other patients. This gives you an opportunity to escape and get out of the chair. You wiggle in the chair and get out with the power of adrenaline given to you from the utter shock and pain you'd be feeling from having four fingers cut off. Walking out of Traeger's dodgy toilet surgery, you stumble upon one of Traeger's victims, which seems to be alive, claiming to be normal and an executive within Mount Massive. The executive claimed Dr. Wernicke's nightmares worked, worked too well, and that he couldn't control it. Wernicke's nightmares, he worked too well, and he couldn't control it, and you can't control it. Nobody, nobody. No, Marie. I think this guarantees that Wernicke isn't dead. Well, unless this nightmare ripped him to shreds. Could this be the so-called wall rider the priest is trying to show us? The elevator requires a key, so you have to play a bit of a game of cat and mouse with Traeger. You obviously being the mouse. This section, in my opinion, was so well made. 
as you always feel on edge, as wherever you go, you always hear Traeger nearby, snipping his massive scissors and stepping heavily on the crappy wooden floor. Another new mechanic introduced, which I love, is when you move too fast near Traeger's victims, you would startle them, leading them to scream and alert Traeger. So to traverse safely, you have to move slowly near victims, but move to cover fast and Traeger is near, creating a choice of running or hiding. Walking into a bathroom, you stumble upon a document from a David Annapurna, requesting reassignment to stop working at Mount Massive, claiming that they have suspicions that some of the patients may have been abused. David decides to email with a threat of resigning and going to the press. Surely this will end well. Once you get the key, you need to loop around Traeger and get back to the elevator. Finally, a glimpse of hope. The exit is just one button away. But this hope is very sadly interrupted, making me think there is zero point of having any hope on escape. I mean, being real here, Traeger deserved to die. But did he really need to leave one last f you? As now, the elevator doesn't f work because his skinny, f hairless, cat looking corpse is now blocking it. Escaping the elevator from the hatch eventually takes you to the stairs, which you walk down, leading you to Father Martin. Meet me outside. We're close now. I mean, we could ignore the father and try to escape, but our curiosity seems too strong. In fairness, I haven't heard anyone say curiosity killed the cat in a very long time. In a changing room on the way to meet the father, you find a document. A document which tells us what happened to poor David Annapurna. It tells us that David was admitted as a patient into Mount Massive to treat his persecutorial delusions, and that his treatment will go on to his death. This man seemed fine from his previous document. Mount Massive is clearly admitting staff into treatment when they question the actions of the company. Does this company have any morals? Carrying on towards the exit, you come up to a massive room engulfed in flames, with the pyromaniac who caused the fire sitting sorrowfully close to the kitchen door. He then proceeds to say, I had to burn it. All of it. Murkoff took so much from us. Used us. Turned us into these things because nobody cares about a few forgotten lunatics. So let it burn. No one in this asylum has supported the case of Murkoff. So far, I've seen very little defense on their actions against the poor people with an employment and treatment. I believe factors like this are slowly bringing Miles to change his aim from escaping to exposure. I think Miles is starting to question the chance of him ever making it out back to the comfort of his own bed. To get past the flames, you have to turn on the sprinklers. And to turn on the sprinklers, you've got to get the water running again. So you've got to sneak past Chris and turn two valve switches and press the sprinkler button, allowing you to return to the main room and head towards the exit. <laughs> Finally, at the exit of the male ward, our aim is to find Father Martin and not escape over the fence. In the darkness, it's hard to find where to go, as this place is similar to that of when we were in the huge sewer room. As once again, we can't rely on the comfort of the wall, let alone see very well. We aren't alone outside, but the company we are with isn't something familiar, as a thing doesn't seem human, but rather something supernatural. At first, I can't imagine many would believe Father Martin, as when he said his Lord was tearing his truth into the unbelievers, it seemed a bit absurd, but now I'm starting to call myself a believer. Either that, or I'm going insane with the rest of the patients. Maybe this is where we belong. In the female ward, you walk upon Father Martin standing above you, shouting down at you, saying that you saw the wall rider and are starting to understand. You're beginning to understand, but not yet. I guess this answers the question on whatever that thing was outside. Something about the scenery in the female ward I love is the fact that it's so decrepit. Although the rest of the game is very gloomy and destroyed as well, the female ward is completely in bits, with entire floors, walls and doors completely caved in, more than anything else in the game. It makes the female ward seem significantly more dangerous, as now not only patients you gotta watch out for, but now you gotta use your parkour skills. Also, side fact for the Kumas out there, there aren't any female patients present as they had been relocated as said by the Outlast wiki, the very wiki which has helped me very much so in making this video.
To follow the father, we gotta go upstairs. Once you get upstairs, you gotta get a key to unlock the door to get to the father. To do this, you gotta grab three fuses, all placed in different rooms, with each room having dangerous patients, all having psychotic fears. Once getting the fuses and popping them into the fuse box, it drops the corpse of the key down the laundry chute. So you gotta pop back downstairs, grab the key, avoiding another psychotic patient. Behind a set of stairs is a document, giving us more context on the wall rider. Claiming that the wall rider is a demonic creature of German descent, which has had sightings of sucking milk and blood out of men's and women's nipples while they sleep. A very common German activity. Both Wernicke and this creature are said to come from Germany. Wernicke must have brought this nightmare with him, but failed to control it. On the way to the father, the female ward really shows how bad the quality of the building is, as the floor literally caves in at your feet. Following, the blood arrows point us towards a room where the naked twins are once again waiting for us in. So, once my scared ass ran away and noticed a shrine, I loop back round and head directly through. The room is completely destroyed. I'm shocked it doesn't collapse beneath- This section takes the cake for being the scariest section in the whole game as this section uses a lot of lighting and sound to make you always feel uneasy, as well as the fact you don't have the one thing that's kept you alive unlike all the other sane people here. Every corner you take towards the retrieval of your camera feels unsafe, as you can barely see what's near, and at some points you can't see at all. Once you grab the camera, you find that it's not exactly in the state you last left it, but hey ho, gotta keep moving. Finally back to a moderately clean office, I felt weirdly at ease and at home, but that could also be that Big Chris is back, or that this may be my home for eternity. Once again, like when we first arrived at Mount Massif, we got to use a vent to enter the main upstairs lobby. In one of the rooms is a document from the 6th of September 1938, which had been translated from German, speaking of Dr. Wernicke's successes in his research of cellular regeneration and guided cancer regeneration through the continuation of the research he and Alan Turing had been developing prior to the relationship falling apart, and that this continued research had led to the creation of something called the Morphogenic Engine. This document also speaks of the War Rider, saying that Wernicke's research with such engine had breached the spiritual realm. The person writing this even claims that Wernicke's research is so impressive that the Fuhrer himself may need to be aware of his discoveries. So it seems whatever this engine is, is the cause of the supernatural demon running rampant around the asylum. Heading towards what seems to be the chapel, one of the father's men rushes down and tells us to grab the key to the chapel from behind the projector in the theatre. You have to see the movie, so that's where I left the car, okay? In the main theatre room, the screen blasts on and starts playing an interview recorded with Dr. Wernicke, revealing his theory on how he was so successful with his research before being taken to the USA under Operation Paperclip. As Wernicke believed, what made the morphogenic engine so successful was the patient being under complete and utter overwhelming madness, as well as being the witness of extreme amounts of horror, like many during the time of Nazi rule in Germany. You're saying the experiment needed the proximity to this, to overwhelming madness. Only a test subject who had witnessed enough horror was capable of activating the engine. Do you believe your test subjects achieved something supernatural? No. Do you think that they contacted something supernatural? Nothing is supernatural. Then what was it? You said Project Wallrider was a gateway. A gateway to what? Wernicke then ends the interview with claiming the Wallrider isn't supernatural, to which he doesn't respond to the interviewer when he asks, what is it then? After grabbing the key from behind the projector and heading back to the lobby, you can unlock the door and start heading towards the chapel. On the way to the chapel, you see a lot of patients praying to the wall rider, seeming more at peace than most patients were at the start of the game. Walking into the chapel, you see the father strung up, crucified on a cross, claiming that this is our penultimate act as a witness, and that we will be spared to share his gospel. was always freedom from death. And, and here it is. You will watch and record my death, my resurrection. And together we will be free. 
It seems our belief in the father was correct, as he gave us a way out, but in the end he was just like the rest of the patients. Mad. You grab the key and head towards freedom. Turn the elevator on and head towards the ground floor. But again this is a lie, and the elevator doesn't stop going down. The elevator ends at a lab. This must be the lab containing the morphogenic engine mentioned in the document earlier. It's so clean down here compared to that of the rest of the asylum. The only visible messes down here are the remains of Murkov employees. Walking through, you can see that the cameras down here are still on. It seems we are being watched. It also seems that there aren't any patients down here. So unless all the employees spontaneously combusted, then it must have been linked to the wall rider. Inside one of the many labs down here contains a document written from a Jennifer Rowland questioning the successes of the senile Nazi, obviously being Wernicke, claiming that Project Warrider has only seen slight successes in the areas of cell migration and morphogenesis, but seeing no success in the creation of a sentient, independent swarm, meaning the Warrider. Jennifer Rowland also claims that a patient overcame enough tranquilizers to put down a hockey team, and that the hormone therapy which comes with the research may be counterproductive and making the patients too strong to control and experiment on. Showing that the patients are far from willing participants in this experiment. But like we also found out earlier, some aren't patients, but also disobedient employees. Walking down the long corridors, you can find a window on your left with a beam of light shining through, showing another possible exit. But once again, with no one's shock, the wall rider is waiting for you around the corner. Running away from the wall rider, you eventually come to the double doors, with Chris on the other side. He grabs you. Could this be the end? No more Uh, never mind. Running away, you hear a voice on the intercom. Someone's alive down here. Please don't be a trap like last time. I know, I, I know. I am supposed to be dead. No, no such luck. Wernick is alive against all odds, and he reveals the truth that all these experiments were to develop a power beyond anything seen before, and to control it. So all the people put into these experiments were potential candidates to wield such power, but as a puppet to Wernicke. But only those who have witnessed utter horror and overwhelmed with total madness can host the power through the morphogenic engine, as said in Wernicke's previous interview, showing that this wasn't supernatural, but a sick game of those in power to push modern weaponry to the maximum, even if that meant bringing those already in mental strife further down the pit of insanity. Wernicke then mentions Billy, one of the many patients admitted into Mount Massive, but also one of the patients constantly mentioned in documents and by former employees when speaking of Project Wallrider. Wernicke claims that Billy was able to wield the power, and the reason Wernicke isn't dead is that Billy sees Wernicke as a father. Billy is only 23, yet his life has been ruined by scientists with utter greed and lack of self-reflection. He isn't even alone in this world. He is a loving mother, as shown by his very first document found in the asylum. A mother which had seen through the dimmed glass of Murkoff from the start, and attempted to sue them, but clearly came to no prevail, as the manipulation Billy was put under in the asylum led to him dismembering his own mother, as he felt she had betrayed him and abandoned him. Wernicke then ends his speech by claiming Billy's death would end this nightmare, and gives us the task to turn off the morphogenic engine, killing Billy in the process. We have no choice but to accept this task. As you have come this far, we might as well be the ones to end this. On the way to the morphogenic engine, Outlast decides to add one final aspect to the game, where well, you can't see the wall rider unless you use night vision. This makes this section significantly more scary in my opinion, besides the obvious fact that you can't see the wall rider chasing you, 
but that in a bright complex when your night vision is almost uncomfortable because how bright it is, is weirdly the time when you need it the most. At the security terminal before entering the main room, a document is found with a dead security guard slumped over it. The document is an employee notice from Dr. Wernicke, telling people not to worship the wall rider, nor allow the patient's delusions to influence your beliefs. Wernicke also says that believing the wall rider as a god could lead to total destruction, and that staff must by all means remember they are scientists. Down a long corridor, a set of wide concrete doors open to reveal the engine, the engine which has caused all this horror. To end this, Billy must die. To kill Billy, we have to turn off three vital systems, all in separate parts of the central facility, all while being chased by what seems to be a god. <laughs> On the way to one of the vital systems, you can find a document saying that Billy's mother gave Murkoff permission to essentially torture and experiment on Billy. She was no mother, she was bad as the others. She betrayed her child and left him to rot in a corrupt government facility. But that makes no sense, as earlier when we first arrived, we saw a document saying that she was suing Mount Massive. But from research, I discovered rather than suing Mount Massive for the crimes against Billy, she sued them for a larger settlement of cash to transfer custody to the doctors of Mount Massive. She's more of a monster than Billy. Maybe the people in here deserve to die more than Billy does. Heading back into the main room to finish Billy off, slamming your hands on the kill switch, even though you're missing some fingers, does the trick, and Billy starts to bleed out and die. But this isn't before the wall rider throws you around like a chance toy. to then what seems to enter your body and let you fall to the ground. With your camera in hand, missing fingers and a limp, comes the final stretch to leave the asylum. However, the fantasy of escaping ends. As deep inside we knew escaping was never an option, as Miles is gunned down for being a witness to the atrocities of Mount Massey. Not only have you been gunned down, but it seems you became the vessel for the Wall Rider. You have witnessed enough horror and felt enough pain throughout your time at Mount Massive to harness the power without the machine. So this is it. Today I'm going home. Six months it's taken. If I'd come here sooner, I might have been out in three. But all I could think about was fear. The way everyone was all against me. How much I hated George. How wrong I was. Or no, not wrong. Sick. And now that I'm well again, I can't help feeling just a little sad. The way you always do when you leave a place where you've lived, learned, and grown. But I am well, and I know it. I'm able to face the world again, my own hometown. 
I suppose there'll be some folks who'll stare and talk and sneer. But no matter what they say or do, one thing I know. These people here, this place and time, have given my life back to me.